1 Timothy chapter 6, picking up in verse number 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I'll read a handful of verses and then we'll, we'll come back to it and uh, start, start picking it apart here a little. So Paul says this to Timothy. He says, all slaves should know... Oh, let's try this again. Okay, I got to read the right thing here. All slaves should show, there we go, full respect for their master so they will not bring shame on the name of God and his teaching. If the masters are believers, that is no excuse for being disrespectful. Those slaves should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well loved. Teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the, the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicion. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. And yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich, they fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And so, Father, I, I pray now that you would bless your word to our hearing, that Holy Spirit, that you would lead us and guide us and teach us and that you'd speak to us. We ask this by faith, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as we take a peek at this here, final lessons, man. This chapter is packed full of all kinds of stuff. And the first idea that I guess I want to share with you here in verses 1 and 2 is nothing more than the Christian ethic. The Christian ethic, you know, and, and, and if we were to, uh, maybe if we were to take that and overshadow the whole chapter here, maybe it would fall within that as well, the Christian ethic. You know, because of these lessons are things that we need to understand. And we also need to be able to attach them to the other parts of the scripture, and so, so right out of the gate here, I want you to remember, I want you to be able to recognize that the Christian, Christian ethic of su submission spills into all areas of our life. And I'm having a hard time with my S's tonight, spilling and submission and all that. And so, so the Christian ethic, it spills over into every area of our life. And, and here's some examples. Take a look at the screen here. When it comes to this ethic... Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that, that Paul would tell us here that submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I love the way that the NLT puts that. So if you have time to look it up in the NLT, I encourage you to take a peek at it. But, but this, is, this is part of that Christian ethic. It is submission and submitting to one another. Why? Well, it's done out of the, the reverence or the fear of Christ. That's why. God said it, we do it. End of story. Second thing is this is submission to the government and to its officers. This is Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, it's also some of the stuff that we saw when we went through First and Second uh, Peter here on our Sunday morning study. Uh, and that is a very big challenging thing, especially right now when we see all the mayhem going on. But it is a Christian ethic. This is it. This is what God has told the church to do. He did not tell us to get behind ungodly practices. He did not tell us to, uh, to, to love bad policy. He didn't tell us that. But he has taught us to respect the institution or to submit to the institution, the government and its officers, because what? Well, because God uses those things for good in our life. But when they're contrary to Christ, well, that's a different story. It's not the scope of this study. Take a look at our first and second Peter study if you'd like to hear the fullness of that. Uh, third thing is this, is comes out of Hebrews 13 and 17. So this Christian ethic, as it goes from one Submitting one to another in this reverence towards Christ and the government is the next one. Now it goes to here. is submission to our spiritual leaders. Again, Hebrews 13 and 17. Uh, we see that. And, and uh, you know, no matter which category you choose there, these are all, 
uh, referencing a heart condition, that I, I need to receive it from God and I need, need to obey it by faith. And that can be a very difficult thing, especially, you know, when it's in a direction that you don't want to move. Fourth one is this. Uh, this is where we're at right now. First Timothy chapter six, verse number one. This is all about being submitted to our employers out of respect for God. This is it. So the Christian ethic. Now, it's interesting to note that the Christian obeys these particular principles for living. Why? Well, because they know and they love God. God says that if, that if we know him, that if we love him, that we will obey him. Uh, you know, we, we get... Uh, the epistle of 1 John who opens this up in five chapters about speaking about these things. Uh, and it is so beautiful to unf unfold it. But we could just know, uh, you know, topically here as we look upon these things, that, that for the Christian, obeying and living by the principles of God, this is just an expression of, of our love for God. It's, it's, it's uh, maybe, maybe I could put it a different way. Maybe we could recognize this as spiritual fruit. Now, the, again, the sign of being submitted to Christ. And so um, let's, do, um, uh, let's do a, uh, a little bit of Bible Olympics here. I, I'd love for you to start finding Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we will stick it on the screen, but I'd like for you to turn there as well. Because in the book of Colossians, uh, specifically chapter 3, chapter 4, it, it, it covers, Paul covers over there a little bit deeper unfolding of this discipleship here for our daily living and he touches on what we're looking at right here in first timothy six so over in chapter three and four uh if you were to go all the way down towards uh, i don't know let, let's just call it as, as uh, verse number 20 and just park right there for a second uh, that, that starting right about that spot there that he opens up this discipleship for domestic living he moves on down in verse 22 and a little farther, and now we have this civil life that is there. He goes farther than that into chapter 4, and we see at the beginning verses there that there's the spiritual life that is covered. And then he, he gets to about um, verse number 7, chapter 4, verse 7 in Colossians, and, and, and now he starts, he starts speaking to these areas of relationships within our life. And so that full spectrum of uh, discipleship there, if you will, and, and here's what I want to highlight here for us. Colossians 3, verse 22 through 25, it says this. He says, slaves, he says, obey your earthly ma masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time. Not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong that you have done. For God has no favorites. You know, I, 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 can, I can remember... Um, getting my, my first real job outside the scope of the family. Uh, I worked in a lumber yard. It's like 16 years old. It's called Dixie Line Lumber in, in San Diego. It would, uh, uh, it's, it's definitely not big like a, a Home Depot, but that would kind of be the flavor of it there, if you will. And, you know, there I was in, in the, you know, the mid-1980s there, my first little job and all of this stuff. Uh, I scared to death to do it. But, but I have to tell you, the things that were passed on down to me from my grandfather, from even my dad, in, in, in working, I, I, I understood this. They did not come to this chapter and verse here like we're seeing within Colossians and them pass on some type of a Christian ethic. But they did pass off an ethic to me. And, and, and what God says within his word is that as we're working, we do this in such a way not to be the servicing of the eyes. You know, it's not, oh, there's the boss. Okay, I got to get to work here real fast. And, oh, he's gone now. I'm going to kick back and have some more coffee and all that stuff. And, and, and why the temptation may be there to do that, gang, we must understand that the Christian ethic is, is that we're working for Christ. And because we work for Christ, when we lay our hand to something, we're doing it with that in mind, with that heartbeat, is that I'm serving Jesus in this. And, and, and this can speak to all of us, no matter what age, no matter what, because Tonight, we're gathered here on a Wednesday night. We're inside of the church, right? You know, I, I, I know that I run into those relationships from time to time through the hallways here 
that you know, somebody may not be having the best conversation and then I suddenly just pop out of a door and slide on behind. Oh, pastor, how are you? And, you know, and the conversation changes all of a sudden. No, no, no. I'm just a man just like you are. God sees the whole thing, right? We need to make sure that however we're talking, it's legit all the time. And so uh, just realize that this Christian ethic here, if you will, it's, it's, submi- it's submission. I got to get away from my S's. I don't know what my problem is tonight, but I got a lot of S problems here. It's just, blah, blah, it's not working. And so let's go on to the second idea. The second idea here, verses 3 down through 10. Now we move a little bit farther here in what, uh, what we get in this final lessons, the final instructions here of First Timothy is he moves into an area. Uh, I, I just put the big concept on it of discernment. Okay, because he's giving this practical discernment, you know. Um, and, and, and really, as he drills down with this, this is, this is kind of pointed to people that are rejecting good teaching. Uh, maybe, maybe we could view it this way. Maybe I'll just kind of uh, block these things together here. Uh, take a peek at the screen here. Uh, these, the rejection of the teaching here, verse 4, verse 5, uh, it says this. It says, anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. Uh, this stirs up the arguments, and, and, and we see what the ending is. It's jealousy, it's division, it's slander, evil suspicion, and so forth. And, and, and what do they do? It says that these people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt, and they have, they've turned their backs on the truth. And, and, and I want us to realize that. That we can read the scriptures and we can gain that spiritual discernment. And the spiritual discernment, it comes back here to people that are rejecting good teaching. And what do you see? Three things. In verse number four, you see that they lack understanding of the scriptures. And that could be an aspect of discernment. If somebody comes to you and is, is, is rejecting this, rejecting the truth of God's word, uh, or, or, or putting forth these different counter arguments to God's word, those things should be held in highly suspect position there. Second thing is this, is that we understand that um, there, there are people that are unhealthy within relationships. They're unhealthy within the church relationships. Again, verse number four, it speaks about that. Uh, and then five, uh, the capstone of this, what do they do? They're people that cause trouble. Okay, so, so the practical discernment behind this is, is when that, that rejecting of good teaching when they're, when they're promoting something else and their lifestyle is demonstrating something else, it just reflects that there's a lack of understanding of what the Bible really has to say. And that just breeds an unhealthy problem here. So what do we do with that? You know, how, how, do, we, how do we respond to these particular things? Well, surely there's a, 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 a bigger process here within the scriptures, but this is what I want to share with you tonight. Flip back in your Bible here. If you're in First Timothy, maybe you just turn one or two pages, and you're right there in Second Thessalonians. Now, Second Thessalonians chapter uh, 3, verse 14 and 15, uh, it will also be on the screen here. Let me just highlight it by saying that, that Paul is, is wrapping down uh, this letter to those that were in Thessalonica, and, and he's trying to exhort the people to this proper living. And, 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 and what he comes down to is, is that, listen, there's going to be some people that, that while they claim to know God, while they claim to follow God, clearly the obedience in their life is that they don't know God and that they're pushing off of God. Well, what do you do with that person? He says it right here. He says, take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. I think we can digest that. Here's where it gets sticky. Watch. He says, stay away from them so they will be ashamed. Well, goodness gracious, how could God tell us such a thing like that? That sounds, that sounds harsh. Well, he goes farther. He gives us more amplification because he says, don't think of them as enemies. He says, but warn them as you would a brother or a sister. So understanding that there is a time when we pull back and maybe we just halt everything that is happening there. When, when, when people are just disregarding basic, simple Christian truths and they're claiming to be a, a, a part of the body of Christ. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Here's the phrase you often hear. Well, I go to church. That's great. That's awesome. I can walk through my garage, but it doesn't make me a car. You know, I'm... <laughs> My wife tells me I'm heavy as a bus sometimes, but aside from that, not a car. And that's how you deal with it. 
And so that can be, that can be a tough thing to do. And I'm, I'm, uh, I know the scripture is not advocating here. You know, that's, you don't deal with every problem that way. But the, but the people that refuse the basic doctrines within the, the scriptures, the people that re- refuse the, the Christian ethic as we started our time off with here tonight, but there is a certain way to handle them within the body of Christ. Let me give you a couple uh, healthy responses here. So, so that is a response that we're seeing. But let me, let me highlight some, some simple truths. Man, this might be a little bit easier to hang on to. Uh, it'll be on the screen. And you may have heard this over the course of time. It's something that we, we practice heavily around here. And that is, first one is, is unity in the uh, essential Christian doctrine. There is no compromise at all. There, there's, you know, the spirit of the age is blowing all kinds of different things through the church right now. But we must understand that we, we can never compromise on Christian doctrine. God is a God of love and he's a God of truth and he never compromises one or the other. And so the essential Christian doctrine. The second thing is this. Um, again, these are all just kind of uh, little snapshots, if you will, kind of reduced down. But the second idea is, is liberty and non-essential doctrine. You know, we got to learn to be flexible in those areas that are gray. Okay, the scripture may not exactly say X, Y, and Z on certain topics. And when the scripture doesn't, doesn't speak, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, tell us something about that. We have to be very careful to remain silent in those, those areas. But when it does speak, well, we have to make sure that we're speaking in those areas. But there's liberty and non-essential doctrine. And then the final thing, you know, this is, um, again, this is what weaves everything together. Uh, and that is love, you know, we, charity in all things. And so what is the aim for the Christian? You know, as we're going through these, ins- these last lessons here in First Timothy, the last little building blocks, these last little tiny things that we're putting together. You know, the aim is unity in both truth and love. It's not division. How? Well, Paul's core message here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, was is that we would know how to conduct ourselves in the house of God. That we would understand these things. And truth and love is something that is super important. It, you know, it feels like an elementary message, but, but you know, how, how is it that so quickly that we can come to this place and we can look around our community and we look across the, you know, the spectrum of the so-called body of Christ and, and that we can find all these crazy things being embraced. It's like, wait a minute, that's not what the historical truth tells us. That's not what the scripture says. And yet you're finding people embracing that under the name of love. Oh, Truth never compromises love, and love never compromises truth. They both have to stick together, okay? And, and, and that, that unity, if you will, is, is um, well, that's what allows us uh, to not move to a place of division. But when, when love or truth is compromised, it puts you upon, well, th- then all of a sudden it's man building his way, and it's not us walking in the ways of God, so skip ahead now, verse number six. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go across these a little bit different here. But uh, verse number six, one more time. He says, he says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. And so what are Christians supposed to do as it pertains to um, money, riches, entertainment, opportunities to do great things and all that stuff. You know, what, what are we to do? You know, and what is he trying to tell us here? Why does he spend within this particular chapter here? I mean, he mentions it once, twice, three, four times throughout the course of this chapter uh, about riches and the instructions that Timothy is supposed to give. And, and that's what we're going to drill down into here. But, but the basic concept, if we can just catch this right out of the gate, is that Christians are to keep a light touch upon the world. That's the idea. We're not to strive to store more treasures here on earth. Now, I'm, I'm, this year I'll be 51 years old. And I walked with Jesus for 30 years. But I will tell you, it seems like through the course of COVID, so this is two and a half years, that, that my... Um, perception of the world as a Christian ha- has really changed quite a bit uh, because I've seen how much loss that has happened. Uh, let me give you an example, and I hope I'm not going too personal here with this. Uh, we'll find out, okay? Um, listen, I've, I've had the same life insurance policy now for, uh, 
for 25 years, okay? <clears throat> and just at the end of uh, last week, uh, I learned that this universal life insurance policy that I've had forever, that the fees are radically changing what I pay to it because of the conditions that are going on within our world right now. And I'm stinking baffled by this. And, and I get these little reports, okay, I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a rich guy. I live, I, I don't want to say, I don't live paycheck to paycheck, but we live on a very, I live on a fixed budget. That's the way, for those of you that are retired on Social Security, I know how you feel. I live on a fixed budget. That is the fixing. And, and, and the rate of change of what's happening in my little world right now is, is greater than my fixing, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, that's true, but that hurts. Um, but I've seen this from a new vantage point or I, I'm not even sure what the right word to, to say, but I'll tell you what Jesus says, okay? You hear me on this. Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 19 and 20. He says this from the New Living Translation. He says, don't store treasures here on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. A verse that you have heard, Yes? Okay, we've heard this verse, but what's the point behind it? Well, 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 Jesus speaks these things, right? This is the Sermon on the Mount. And the basic lesson behind the Sermon on the Mount, well, grab your chair and hang on because it's going to get awesome right here. Here's the basic lesson from this. Here's, here's, here's kind of what we're, we're seeing underscored here from Paul to Timothy for the church in Ephesus and us as the church at large here in 2022 is that the follower of Christ is to narrow all of their interest until our heart, until our mind, until our bodies, watch, are focused on Jesus. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. Is It's just about this. Jesus tells us, or I should say, uh, the Father speaks through Isaiah and he says this in Isaiah 45 and 22. He says, look to me. This is it. What Paul is giving to Timothy here in these final details, in this final putting these lessons together, this instruction, this brick by brick, is he's bringing him back to this point of saying very simply to recognize and to look to Christ over all the stuff that he will see within the church and the stuff that people will experience and be taken away and be held captive and even put themselves into some type of turmoil, either now or in the coming future when they stand before Christ. And these lessons, as we sit here in March of 2022 with this uh, Russia-Ukraining war, with the inflation stuff that is going on and impacting all areas, uh, do you realize that on communion weekend, there's, there's an effect upon you guys right here in this church on communion weekend? Do you know how difficult it is for us to get stinking communion crackers here? Do you know why some of the things that you're tasting in more recent days are spongy? Not sure. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You can't find them at the store. You have to order them and you pay $50 billion to get a little bag of oyster crackers out. Try, you test it and try it yourself. If you got a whole mess of them, bring them in from Amazon. We'll bring them down here. We'll buy them from you. We're not going to pay you $50 billion, but, you know, we, we may soon be eating styrofoam. I'm not sure. And I can be a little, little funny about that. But as he's narrowing down on these things, I want you to think about this stuff. I, I, I know I'm trying to give instruction here, but I want you to think about it tangibly in your life right now. What's inflation doing to your money right now? If you have your money parked in the bank, what's inflation doing to that? Well, it depends. Well, if, is, if inflation is 5%, guess what? Your dollar is 5% less. If it's 10%, your dollar is 10% left. You may have the same number that's showing up in the bank, but the purchasing power for that just by sitting there is that much less. And that is a real scary factor, you know? It, it's, it, it, it's something that can move us to this place and go, oh, God. I, I know I'm not to put my aim upon these things. I, 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 I know that, that whether it's the Sermon on the Mount or what Timothy is, is being taught here, what we as a church are being taught here today, is that when my hope is within those riches and my life is built around the sustaining of that or living for that, what does it take to shake that? 
Now, a month ago, I imagine Putin and his friends and the rest of the, uh, you know, the, the counterbalance of, of our own people getting sanctioned now and all that stuff probably held a different thing. But these very wealthy guys that are all of a sudden having their, their monies in international markets halted and frozen, and we're talking to the tune of millions and billions to some of these guys, there's a real factor, and it really shakes people. It wouldn't surprise me if we begin to see real high-level people under this freeze start to commit suicide, and you see where their focus is at. What does that mean for us as the little guys? Well, his message is not to stir, stir up fear, but it is, is to bring us back a, uh, to a sobriety of mind. Here's a promise maybe we can consider. Psalm 37, this will be on the screen, I believe. Psalm 37, verse 18 to 19 in the NLT. The psalmist says this, that day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. I love the promises of God because that, that just takes the fear and the anxiety right out of my heart because I see what God said. I go, oh, no, 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 that's my God right there. This is what my God has promised to me. And, and, and what Paul is giving to Timothy and what he's trying to, to speak to him, to speak to the people that are within the church, he wants them to anchor in at the right place. He doesn't want them to get caught up in the aspect of the riches. And, and, and do this, for just, uh, humor me for a second. If you came with nobody, look to somebody across the aisle. But, but just look to the person next to them and, and say, you're rich. And that's not your first name either. I don't mean it that way. Uh, literally speaking, as, as we're as first century Christianity, okay? They were way poor. You don't even understand what that means. I mean, I saw a report here. I think it was in, uh, gosh, I forget the article that was referenced. But it was on LinkedIn is what I, I saw it from. It was an article out of, out of Denver here. It says that our, our homeless people in 2020, that the, that the average amount that I guess whatever we paid or the resources they received, the homeless folks in Denver, by the way, it was $104,000 yeah, $104, dollars is what was spent on the homeless folks, like one person <laughs> in Denver in 2020. I, and, you know, the, the contrast in the article had to do with what's being sent for the homeless folks and what's being sent within our school. And I read that number, and I shared it with Justin today. I go, you've got to be kidding me. Even the homeless within our country are doing way better than a many, a lot of us, I guess. <laughs> That's why it's, it's laughable. It really is a, a laughable thing here. That's insane. But, it, but it's absolutely true and sobering that when we realize he's writing to rich, you know, he's saying for those people that are within the church, he says, tell, speak to the rich, tell them about these particular things. Speak up and say something to them. Help them to adjust their focus. Take a look on the screen. Here's another side of the coin. Okay, we just got a promise in Psalm 37, but let's look to the other side of the coin. Let's look at a serious problem. Ecclesiastes 5, I'll read it from the screen here for us. He says, there's another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Keep going. He says, money is put into risky investments that turn sour and everything is lost. In the end, there is nothing left to pass on to one's children. Final verse. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. Now, that's Solomon. Yes, it is pessimistic, but it rings forward with a truth that is popping up here in the last items of instruction for Timothy, and it's a major theme in chapter 6 of Timothy. What's the point? Scroll down to verse number 10, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. He says this, he says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Hmm, very interesting. In unchecked desires, they lead us into harmful living. That's what the scripture teaches us. And this, this love of money here, I know that, that many times we just stop right there, you know, on the, on the love of money. It's not having money, it's a love of money. I think we just stop with that phrase and we don't open it up in the Greek and, and tell us, well, what is this all about? 
it, it, it speaks about the person who is ungenerous in the amount that they give. Now, if you were here on Sunday, we worked our way through a topical message and we referenced all the way back to the end of Acts chapter 2. And we saw the early church in, in what the condition of generosity is supposed to be. That, con that condition of generosity was is that you would see that they were the folks that had some and the folks that had nothing within the church, that there was this open giving till it hurts, if you will. I'm not asking where you're at in that. And this is not a message about tithing and all that. This is a message that Paul gave to Timothy, and it's for us as well here in 2022, so that we could recognize those conditions, one, where we stand, two, what we're supposed to aim for, and three, that we can see that when we're, when we're not lining up to these particular things, we're not using the resources that God has given to us for the plan that God has. It's an elementary conversation, but if, uh, if, by show of hands, is anybody part of the church, Big C, Body of Christ? I'm not talking about the fellowship. If you're a part of the Body of Christ, raise your hand up so I can see. Okay, hold your hand up. Keep your hands in the air. Look around the room for yourself, okay? You see that? You see all those members? Okay, you put your hands down. Now, now here's the elementary conversation. If you're part of the Body of Christ, there is no reason we have to have a conversation about generous giving and tithing and offering and all of that stuff. You're reading the scripture yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying? As you're going through the particular scripture and you're looking at this, your life is to be shaped around Christ. It's not for the pastor to get up here and pound the pulpit. Oh, give us more. We need a bigger thermometer with more money and take seven more offerings. We don't do that here. It's not the way we roll. But as you're taught about what Christ has said, about what the New Testament is, about, about the focus and the heartbeat behind this, you understand that it is generosity that drives and it's a demonstration of really where you're at with the Lord. When you come into, um, when you come into this fellowship, um, when you're first here, uh, you know, either as a brand new believer or as a... <laughs> or, uh, or as a... Uh, uh, thank you, guys. Uh, or as a um, someone that's just getting started here uh, in the fellowship, we take you through these next step class to teach you the, the the foundational things of faith, of what it looks like to accept Christ. Water baptism, participation, service, contribution. We walk you through these things, and because we do it in the next step class, it, we don't have to. I don't have to get up here week by week and pound this and give more, give more. You know and all this. No, 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 no. We don't roll that way. God doesn't roll that way. We understand that we grow up in Christ. You, you and I, uh, we both have to give account before the Lord and the love of money drills down to the person. It's so crazy. But the person gives an ungenerous amount. And watch, every person in here makes a little something different. There are some that make more. There are some that make less. But... The aspect of contribution is equal when we weigh and measure it according to what the scripture has to say about that generous giving. And where does the generous giving start? It always starts within your, within your church. So if this is your church, where does your giving start? It starts right here. There's where your tithes come in. Why? Because it supports the work of ministry that, that you're a part of as you assemble week, assemble week by week. And then if you want to move into a place of offering, offerings, well, that's above what your, what your baseline giving is. And you move into these compassion things and orphanage and all these other secondary ministries and everything. But knowing the basic of where that starts out so that we're not enslaved under this aspect of the love of money. Psalm 62, verse 10. Take a look at the screen here, NLT. Here's what it says in part. He says, if your wealth increases, don't make it the center of your life. And in America, folks, I'm just speaking, generally speaking, in America, it is the center of our life. It really is. Let's just be honest, okay? I'm not being a drub against you. I'm right in the same boat with you. I, I, I really am. But, but may we understand this with a flexible heart before God and not, you know, uh, I, I don't know if it's right to say this word. I raised girls, so don't get your panties in a wad, okay? Relax. <laughs> yeah, don't get bent out of shape is the idea, Okay. So I, I don't know if that's holy or unholy. I don't mean it. I don't mean it weird. I'm just, you know, I'm just tongue in cheek saying that type of deal there. So if your wealth increases, don't make it the center of your life. Uh, th uh, uh, final idea. Third idea, and we'll, we'll close with this, okay? 
Um, these will be a little bit faster here. Uh, verse 11 down through 21. Uh, he says, but you, Timothy. Now, now he moves on to Timothy and, and he's telling him, he, he says, okay, he, here are these particular things. This is what you can take a look at. Here's the Christian ethic. Here's what to watch out for. There's some people that are going to come in and, and they're going to try to divert away from the historical Christian faith. There's going to be people in there that got money. You need to do these particular things. Keep everybody on track. Here's the building blocks. Keep moving forward. Verse 11, he says, Timothy, he says, you're a man of God. He says, so run from all these evil things. He's saying this right on the back of money. On the back of the money, on the back of the riches. He's saying that, listen, people get sidetracked with that stuff. He says, don't you do that. He says, instead, he says, pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. That's the fight that he's supposed to have. So he's to flee. He's to run from the things that enslave people. It's riches that enslave. Jesus said it this way uh, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10. He says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, over my time as a Christian, I've heard this, this simple phrase of Jesus dumbed down to something like, well, there was a gate in Jerusalem where it was called the camel's gate, and they would have to unpack their camel to get their camel to crawl through this gate because it was such a short gate. Listen, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense lest you come up with nonsense. <laughs> I, I hope that makes sense, okay? Jesus said it's easier for a camel. It's, think about this. I'm holding up a needle here. It's easier for a camel to get through the eye of that needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because the trust is on the riches and not on God. Because the trust is what I have done, what I have accomplished, what I have acquired, and not upon dependency, obedience, love, sacrifice, surrender to a holy God. That's why. Well, how does that speak to us in the sanctuary today? It speaks to us by way of selfish. Because there are many in the body of Christ, there are many within this fellowship that are just straight up selfish. And, 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 and now I'm not talking about little babies. I'm talking about full-grown adult babies at this point. There's just a selfishness that is there. Listen, this is one of those basic heart conditions. You know, people can quote to you all the great scriptures and you look at their life and go, they're selfish as all get out. It's like, Hmm, your, your, your testimony or your witness doesn't match your testimony. You're given all this great, you know, uh, testimony of God, but, but the witness of your life is like, it's over here. You could talk it, but you can't walk it. I hope that makes sense. Craziness. And the flavor behind what Jesus said is, is nothing more than this, is that the rich man, and by the way, we've, we've discovered, we've learned, we know, that every one of us in this room are rich, according to the standards of this world. We're completely rich. But the rich man is one who is possessed by his possessions. And you start touching on those things, and man, let me tell you, the fan mail will arrive. And I'm not checking the email, email box tomorrow. Somebody else will check it. So if you're inclined to give feedback, Jesus at WestminsterCalvary.org, he'll answer it when you see him. <laughs> it's going to be an amazing conversation, I promise. And Christians are prone to, are supposed to be prone to pursuing and building our lives upon biblical truths. And the pastor has to share these things. And that's what Paul was giving to Timothy. He says, share these things. Tell them these things. Matthew 7, Jesus would say that we were to build upon the rock and not the sand. Verse number 12, we're to fight the good fight. He tells Timothy, he says, fight the good fight for the true faith. He says, hold tightly to eternal life to which God has called you which, you, which you have confessed so well before many witnesses. So the fight is for eternal things. It's for keeping God in focus. It's for doing his will. Scrolling down for the advancement of time here because we're at time now. Verse 17, he says, um, he steps it up as the letter closes here. I, I don't know why, but he does. Uh, he says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Uh, let me read on. He says, he, says, he says, teach them these things. And now he goes to this point, verse 18. He says, 
he's still talking about the folks with riches. I mean, he's hammering this. He says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. And so this verse 17, 18, 19 here, you know, this, this command that he's saying, he's saying, he's saying those who are rich, command them, teach them, tell them that they are to deny themselves. So if you're rich in this room and we've discovered, yes, you are, you're an American, you're rich by world standards. So I am to tell you to deny yourself. That's what Paul told Timothy to tell the church. He has it written here for us, and I'm telling you this tonight. You're to deny yourself. He goes on and he says, tell them to invest in good works with their, with their riches. So I'm telling you, invest in good works with your money. I'm just telling you. And the last one, may, this, may, may, you, may you demonstrate that you're doing this and that you're committed to God because you're not hoarding your things, your convenience, your comforts, your riches, your vacations, your supply, your 401k, your investments, your life insurance, like my awesome one that I have. You know, all of those particular things. I, I end up pass it out. It, it doesn't say that we can't have these particular things, but if your sole focus is to store up in those things and you're not pouring it out into God's house, please understand that I am to speak this to you. I am to encourage you in the right direction. And guess what? Newsflash, you're at the end of the age. You get a chance to choose what you're going to do. And, 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 and whether it's by the end of the age or your age, you'll see Jesus soon enough along with me. And, and, and as your pastor, I want to be able to give a good report. And I know this because I know you guys' heart. You guys are awesome, amazing, and, and uh, I think you're awesome and amazing. Uh, I hope that's all the time, but I know you're awesome and amazing to me because you're very kind to me. You're very patient with me. So I believe that in the core of your heart, not to pump you up in a bad way, but to encourage you, I believe that many and most of you have got your hearts right square with Jesus, and, 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 and God would tell you, well done, my good and faithful servant. To those of you that are wrestling in this area, I don't think God is going to condemn you, but I think that conviction is falling upon you and there needs to be a change within your life. May tonight be that night because you realize what I'm supposed to tell you. I'm telling you, deny yourself, okay? All right, um, invest, in, in, invest your money in good works and demonstrate that this is true. Well, how do I do that? Well, I don't know if we have this on the screen, but you have it in your Bibles. Flip to Matthew chapter 19 for a second. This is how. And this is, this is the heartbeat, and uh, we don't have paramedics standing by tonight, so when I read this to you, if you have a heart attack, well, you get to talk to Jesus sooner than I will, so I don't mean that in a bad way. It's always good to see the Lord. All right, so we have a, we have a, a story here. Jesus is telling him about an interaction that he had with this young, rich dude. And down in verse 21, I'm just going to skip to the media of it because we have to close Jesus told this young dude, he says, you know, the young guy says, hey, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? And, and, and Jesus tells him to keep these commandments and do these particular things. He says, man, I've done that since my youth. And now Jesus gives him something else. Verse 21, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Watch. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions so I'm looking here. Who's going to go away sad tonight? Because you have many possessions. Hopefully nobody goes away sad. Verse 23, Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's where the easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. So we have determined that we are the rich people, not necessarily in this story, but within this, this global economy, and surely as it pertains to measures within first century Christianity. What does that mean for us? Does that mean that we're all bad Christians? No, it doesn't mean that at all, and I'm not trying to indicate that, and nor do I want to be heavy up upon us about these things. But this is what Paul is hammering away with as he closes this letter, the building blocks, the nuts and bolts of ministry, the building blocks of the church and all of this stuff, you know, how we're to conduct ourselves within the house of God. And why does he keep wrapping around and hits this thing two, three, maybe even four times within this chapter? I don't know. I have no idea. 
Maybe because it's a real issue in the heart of humans, us? Yeah, probably so. It's a real issue in the heart of our, in, in our heart. But I don't want you to be disillusioned. And nor do I want you to go to this place to where, uh, to where all of a sudden we're in this, this climate right now. And this is, this is your jingling. This is your money right here, okay? In, in, in the inflationary climate that's happening, article that came out here today within the news said that because Russia and Ukraine is a major global supplier of wheat and a few other things, that we can expect some food prices to accelerate all the way to, to, to more around the area of 20% increase. Watch, here's the tendency, here's the fear factor. I don't have enough for myself right now. I'm no longer going to honor the Lord and to give unto the Lord. May that not be the case for any of us. Notice I said us, okay? Because I'm in the same boat with you. I live on a fixed budget. It's fixed. I don't want to be afraid. But I tell you that the conditions that are around can cause me to be that way. And I don't want you to be afraid. Why? Well, what did God tell us? What, what, what was the psalm that we, we read in Psalm 37 that day by day the Lord takes care of the innocent and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. That's what God says. And so what, what, what is Timothy supposed to do? Final verse of our, of our study tonight, verse 20. He says, Timothy. He says, guard what God has entrusted to you. Avoid godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. Some people have wandered from the faith by following such foolish things. May God's grace be with you all. And he closes the book that way. Wow. Okay. Awesome. I have a lot more to say. Uh, or I, I should say I have a lot more on the notes here that, that are put down. We, have no, we don't have the opportunity to get to all of these things tonight because it seems like the focus of what we had drilled in around those two and three and four times that, that Paul mentioned this aspect of riches tonight. And so this is what God had for us tonight. And I, 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 I highly, highly, highly suspect that it is to get some moving and to help some to come back to a place to where anxiety and fear is not there. Can you see the balance in that? Can, can, can we understand that? We've, we've seen the goodness of God. Okay, that needs to comfort our hearts so that we don't have anxiety in a time like this. But we also need to see the light or the instruction and the truth of God's word to also be participants. I don't care what your income amount is. I don't, I don't care. We've, you're Americans in this room. You're here meeting on American soil. And 50% and of our broadcast people that watch us are even outside of America. So folks, we don't know what you're experiencing out there. But I know that you folks here within the room, whether you have one job or two jobs or whatever, I know that God gives us equally whatever that percentage point, that, that, that uh, generosity, if you will, to be able to balance out so that those that make a little, hey, they're still, they're still contributing, okay? Percentage-wise, it's the same thing. Those that make a substantial amount, well, that contribution is still equal and balanced out. And when do we do that? Well, Paul would tell us uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians, he would lay out that that takes place on a weekly basis, uh, basically, uh, if you're getting paid once a week, guess what? You're contributing once a week. If it's twice a week, you're, you're twice a week. If it's once a month, you're once a month. I, I hope you understand just the generality of that. And I'll know how well you respond to this next week. By if you come back. <laughs> number one. Number two, uh, when I get the monthly reports, I'll know how well you respond. I can always, I, you know, I don't know who gives, but I always see these numbers like this. Oh, it's a hard message. <laughs> Seriously? Come on, man. You guys are better than that. We follow Jesus. Let's stand to our feet and let's pray. Uh, Chachi, can you do me a favor back there? Can we collectively clap and put our hands together to kill the live broadcast so I can speak, you know, just for a second here? Let's clap for those folks. We'll talk to you guys later. Live streamers there. Oh, man.